Okay, so we are in Ephesians 4, and we are working our way through. We're down in uh, still, I guess actually we're today we're, we're in verse, we are in verse 5. We move from verse 4 to verse 5. So let's start in verse 1 where we just read down. Ephesians 4, verse 1. I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you that you walk worthy of the vocation wherewith ye are called, with all lowliness and meekness, with long suffering, forbearing one another in love, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, e even as ye are called in one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all and through all, and in you all. So we're continuing to look at the sevenfold unity of the Spirit. We are endeavor to endeavor to keep the unity of the Spirit. And we're looking at the, the, the sevenfold, the, the sevenfold foundation, if you will, um, that make up the unity of the Spirit so that we know what it is, so that we know what it is we're supposed to be keeping and what, what, what makes up the unity of the Spirit so that we can understand how we keep it. Because if we don't know what we're to keep, how are we going to keep it? Um, so, so far we've seen there's one body, that's the church, obviously the body of Christ, and that everyone that responds positively, uh, positively to the gospel is a member of the body of Christ. There's one spirit. That's the Holy Spirit. Again, the very same spirit that was moving at creation is the same spirit that baptized us into Christ, that strengthens our inner man with might, the same spirit that helps us our infirmities, uh, that makes intercession for us, uh, that we are seated with, sealed with until the day of redemption. Uh, we also saw there's one hope of our calling. That hope is the Lord Jesus Christ, in whom are all the promises of God. And they're yea and amen. All our hopes, the, the Bible goes through and it lists several hopes. They're all to be found and they're all vested in and they're all because of the Lord Jesus Christ and what he did on the cross. Um, so last time we looked at the one Lord. And the one Lord, again, I hope is no surprise, is the Lord Jesus Christ. We looked at over 100 names, titles, or descriptions in the Bible that refer to a person. And we saw that, that they all refer to one person. And that one person is the one Lord. Uh, only one person could fulfill all of those things person is the Lord Jesus Christ. We went back in the Old Testament and we looked at, at the issue of people seeing God and yet Jesus said that no man has ever seen the Father. And, and we looked at a bunch of different examples and we saw that, that the Old Testament saints, they did in fact see pre-incarnate Lord Jesus Christ. Um, even it, we also looked at um, Hagar, the Gentile woman. She saw one all Lord Jesus Christ, the incarnate Lord Jesus Christ also. Um, we saw that it was the Lord Jesus Christ that created all things, both the physical creation, but also the, the um, positions that he, can, that he uses to maintain order, if you will, throughout the universe, the, the principalities, powers, thrones, mights, and, and all that. They were all created by him and for him. Then the last thing we looked at is that the issue of the title of the Son of God versus the Son of Man. Again, both titles refer to the one Lord. Uh, Son of God was a reference to the Lord Jesus Christ's deity as the Savior. Son of Man is a reference to him being Messiah, him sitting on the throne of David as the, his Messiah and their king. There was one more thing we didn't get to, and I think it's very important that if we're going to talk about Jesus Christ that we do need to talk about. So look at, we're in Romans, or no we're not, we're, on, we're in Romans on Sunday. So turn over to Ro Romans 3, <laughs> Romans 3 and Colossians 1. And if I can say it this way, and I, I trust you'll understand what I mean, what we're going to look at now is the more, most important part of Jesus Christ for us. Romans 3, verse 24. It says, uh, verse 23, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, being justified freely by His grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. Jesus. Look over at Colossians 1.14. Speaking of the Lord Jesus Christ, it says, In whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins. It's in the Lord Jesus Christ that our redemption is found. It's not found in a theological system. It's not found in a religious system. It's not found in a church. It's not found in our works. It's not found in our flesh. It's not found in the law. It's found in a person. That person is the Lord Jesus Christ. 
ap- um, apart um, from the Lord Jesus Christ who loved you and died for you, there is no redemption. There is no forgiveness of sin. Look over at 2 Corinthians 5.21. Did we get an ad? Yeah. That's okay. 2 Corinthians 5.21. says, for he hath made him to be sin, again speaking of the Lord Jesus Christ, for he hath made him to be sin for us, who knew no sin, that we may, might be made the righteousness of God in him. Again, the Lord Jesus Christ, the one Lord, is our salvation. He was made sin for us, that we may be made the righteousness of God again. a couple of more here and then we'll move on to the next one but look at Philippians 2 9 and Galatians 2 16 Philippians 2 9 first Philippians 2 9 and Galatians 2 Philippians 2 9 says wherefore God also hath highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name and look over at Galatians 2 16 It says, knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by the faith of Christ, even we have believed in Jesus Christ, that we might be justified by the faith of Christ and not by the works of the law. For by the works of the law shall no flesh be justified. For if while we seek to be justified by Christ, we ourselves also are found sinners, is therefore Christ the minister of sin, God forbid. For if I build again the things which I destroyed, I make myself a transgressor. For I through the law am dead to the law, that I might live unto God. I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live. Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me, and who gave himself for me. I do not frustrate the grace of God. For if righteousness come by the law, then Christ is dead in vain. Today, we get the righteousness of God through the faith of Christ, who loved you and gave himself for you. The issue with Philippians there is that issue of being faithful to the cross. Again, I'm going through this tonight because we didn't get to it last night, and I think we would be very remiss not to talk about the salvation and the redemption that is made because of Jesus Christ. All the other stuff is great, but without the redemption, without the salvation, the other the rest of it is, is, isn't even there. I, I love the the end of this verse, this chapter here in Galatians 2:21. It says, "I do not frustrate." I kind of take that to be hinder. I do not frustrate or hinder the grace of God. For if righteousness come by the law, then Christ is dead in vain. I've talked about this before. If you could get righteous by the law, then it doesn't say Christ died in vain. It says Christ is dead. That means if you can get righteousness by the law, then Christ didn't rise because there was no reason for him to rise. And that means Christ is still in the grave. And that's not true. We serve a risen Savior. And Christ is not dead in vain, nor did he die in vain. That I think most times when people read this that verse, they read it, well, then Christ died in vain, and that's not what the verse says. It says Christ is dead. Um, because apart from Christ, there is no righteousness. We don't have any righteousness. We cannot get our righteousness of the law. If we could, there was no reason for Jesus Christ to die. Um, none. Okay. Look over at um, 1 Timothy 1.15. Same great doing this, doing this for me, doing this study because you put together a lesson, and then I have so much time in the car, I have just time to reflect on it and think about it. And I spent the last two weeks just thinking about our Savior. You know, I want this, and well, yeah, there's this, and there's oh yeah, there's that verse over there, and there's this, and then you just kind of go, wow, dude did a lot of stuff for us. <laughs> and it's um, it, you know, it, it, it's it's amazing. First Timothy one fifteen. This is a faithful saying worthy of all acceptation that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of who I am chief. That's the reason Christ came to the earth. He came to save sinners. All that other stuff we look at is a byproduct of that. But Jesus Christ came to earth to save sinners, to redeem his creation. His creation thumbed their nose, gave God the middle finger, if I can put it so crassly. And God said, I got you covered. And he was willing to do so. And that's the purpose for which he came. And as 
we talk about, you know, going into conference. We're gonna, it's going to be a great conference. We're talking about the preaching of the cross. I mean, it's just going to be awesome. We'll, we're going to get a lot of it. And don't, for, don't ever forget, man, the preaching of the cross, the, the basics of the preaching of the cross there and why Jesus came to the church and everything there. That's who we are all assembled. It's just phenomenal. Look at um, chapter 2, you're in 1 Timothy, chapter 2 and verse 3. It says, For there is one, for this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior, who will love all men to be saved and to come unto the knowledge of the truth. For there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself a ransom for all to be testified to be testified in due time. Jesus Christ is all, there's one mediator, and that is all, position is all fulfilled by the one Lord, the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, th- this, this issue of him being our mediator, a lot of times it's thought, okay, we do something stupid, and then God, Jesus turns to the Father and says, okay, forgive Dave. He didn't mean it. it, was, it it's not that issue. The mediation happened at the cross. We're forgiven of our sins. God sees us as being righteous in Christ. His, his, he's our mediator in that he died on the cross and that we are in him. You are forgiven for all your sins. So don't, and there's a lot of people that, that, that teach that and, and, and say that, that, okay, well, every th- good thing Jesus is your mediator because every time you do something, every time you sin, Jesus goes to the Father and says, okay, let's forgive him. And that's, that's not the issue. The mediation is, is, something that happened at the cross and it happens because we are in Christ so I don't want to sometimes I think I know Christianity wants to dumb down Jesus they want to talk about little baby Jesus and uh, it came from TV show, some TV show but Jesus is a grown man <laughs> he's not that helpless baby and and he is the mediator for us um, look over at uh, I know I said this a little while ago. A couple more, and then we'll be done with this. First Corinthians one thirty. First Corinthians one thirty and Colossians three. First Corinthians one thirty and Colossians three. First Corinthians one. Let's pick it up at one twenty nine. That no flesh should glory in his presence. But of him, of God, are ye in Christ Jesus, who of God is made unto us wisdom and righteousness and sanctification and redemption, that according as it is written, he that glorieth, let him glory in the Lord. If you're going to glory, don't glory in your own works, because they're not glory in the Lord, Jesus Christ, because it's in him that we find and receive wisdom and righteousness and sanctification and redemption. He's our hope, our wisdom, our salvation, our righteousness, our sanctification, our redemption. The list goes on and on. Therefore, we shouldn't glory in ourselves. Glory in him who is our life. Look over at Colossians 3, verse 3. For ye are dead, and your life is hid with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, shall appear, then shall ye also appear with him in glory. I'm going to talk about this this weekend, but this is such a great passage. Christ, who is our life. And that's the way we should live. We should live our life in the flesh as if Christ is our life, because Christ is our life. I love verse 3. For ye are dead, and your life is hid with Christ in God. It's like Christ puts his arm around you and says, I love you. And then God the Father puts his arm around both of you and says, I love you. And then the Holy Spirit comes along and seals you. Man, if God be for you, who could be against you? It, it's, it, you get your mind wrapped around the fact that the all-powerful God, the creator of the universe, is for you. And your life is hid with Christ in God and then sealed with the Holy Spirit. No wonder we're more than conquerors through him that loved us. It's just, just an amazing thing if you just take time in your day and dwell on your Savior. And what he did for you, what he continues to do for you, the glory that's going to be revealed in him someday, the, the strength.
strength we have it's it's just wonderful uh, what a and that word is so lacking <laughs> but it is truly wonderful okay so i i I was hoping to put that all together in one lesson, but we ran really long last time. And I, again, I just don't think it's right to go ahead and go back to Ephesians 4 um, if we didn't talk about the redemption and the salvation that we have in our Lord Jesus Christ, the one Lord. So the next thing that he lists here is the one faith. Is one faith. You are called in one hope of your one calling, Therefore, there is one body, one spirit, even as ye are called in one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism. So we're going to talk now about the faith. What is the faith? And I'm sure we probably won't get it all in today. Um, where are we at? Oh, yeah. Um, the faith that Paul is referring to here is no surprise. is the preaching of Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery. It is Paul's gospel, glorious gospel of Christ. As I like to say it, it's Paul's body of work. Today, in the but now, there is just one faith. There are not many ways to get to heaven. There is only one. The meaning behind the bumper sticker coexist is a lie. The only way to get to heaven, to have eternal life, is to trust in the Lord Jesus Christ and the finished work of the cross. Anything other than that is false and is not the true faith and is a lie. And it is not the religious system, which in, Amer you know, in America today, with what's going on, uh, you know, it's, it's a big religious rev so-called revival going on in America today because the Pope's here. Whoopie-doo. I got to thinking about this. Washington, D.C. got the Pope. Rockaway gets Dave Stepped. <laughs> <laughs> Woe to both of you. <laughs> You'll probably hear that joke again, by the way. So um, come with me over to Second, Second Timothy. And what I want to do, I want to look at this issue of the faith, and I want to look at some of the things where Paul talks about the faith. Is our technology working? I think so. Okay. So tech, uh, 2 Timothy 4, verse 6. And we're going to be in and out of this passage, so you might mark it so you can get back to it. 2 Timothy 4, verse 6 says, so Paul's at the end of his life. He's writing his letter to Timothy, trying to encourage Timothy. For I am now ready to be offered, and the time of my departure is at hand. I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day, and not to me only, but unto all them also that love his appearing. Paul says, I have kept the faith. He fought the good fight. He has finished his course. Paul knew his death was coming. He was going to leave earth and go to heaven soon. I love the way he calls it. He's getting ready to depart. You know, uh, we're all going on a trip tomorrow. We're all getting ready to depart and, and go. And boy, what a, what a great thing. He's, he's going to, he's going to depart. He's ready. Bags are packed. Well, he can't take his bags, but you guys know my, my point. You know, and he, it's a one-way journey, and he knows that, man, it's going to be glorious. I mean, oh, that I can have that peace when at that point but he kept the faith he kept that which was given to him like I said we're going to come back here but let's compare this with 1 Corinthians 9 because there's a big issue in Christianity Christendom today the faith and it really fly the faith that qualifier of the really flies in the face of the the teaching of can't we all just get along? Doctrine divides. Jesus died for everybody. That's all that matters. And that's a great thing. And that's the first thing. But there's so much more, as, we've, as we saw just with our study of Jesus Christ that we went through over the last week and a half. And Paul made doctrine and made sound words and made the faith an issue. So look at 1 Corinthians 9. 
and verse 16. He says, For though I preach the gospel, I have nothing to glory of. For necessity is laid upon me, yea, woe is unto me if I preach not the gospel. For if I do this thing willingly, I have a reward. But if against my will a dispensation of the gospel is committed unto me. He's talking about his course here. He was given this course. He, he was given something he had to go do, and he's, he's finished his course. Verse 18. What is my reward then? Verily, that when I preach the gospel, I may make the gospel of Christ without charge, that I abuse not my power in the gospel. For though I be free from all men, yet have I made myself servant unto all, that I might gain the more. And unto the Jews I became as a Jew, that I might gain the Jews. To them that are under the law, as under the law, that I might gain them that are under the law. To them that are without law, as without law. Be not without law to God, but under the law to Christ. Now, I want to pause for a moment. There are those that take this and say, see, Paul was just a hypocrite. He just, he was a chameleon. He just changed his ways, no matter what the audience he was speaking to. Now, he's, a, he's, a, he's approaching them in the way they need to be approached. He's using some discernment, some spiritual maturity, understanding who he's speaking to. It's a different discussion with a Gentile than with a, with a Old Testament Bible-believing Jew. So don't get confused there. Don't fall into the, the trap when people say, oh, yeah, well, Paul, he was just did whatever. That is, it's amazing, too. That's still a, an attack. You can go <laughs> when you If you Google um, Jews and Paul, this is one of the references that modern-day Jews use to attack Paul, even today, that he was a hypocrite. Um, but anyhow, it says, verse 22, uh, to the weak became I as weak, that I might gain the weak. I am made all things to all men, that I might by all means save some. And this I do for the gospel's sake, that I might be partaker of there with you. Know ye not that they which run in a race run all, but one receiveth the prize. So run that ye may obtain. And every man that striveth for the mastery is temperate in all things. Now they do it to obtain a corruptible crown, but we an incorruptible. I therefore so run, not as uncertainly, so fight I, not as one that beateth the air, but I keep under my body and bring it into subjection, lest that by any means, when I have preached to others, my, I myself should be an outcast. What's that? A castaway. Wow. Totally blew that word. He was given a dispensation of the gospel. He was, he was to dispense the good news of the Lord Jesus Christ. The mystery never before revealed until Paul was raised up. You know, in Timothy, he talks about finishing the course. And here he talks about runners run. Portland Marathon's coming up. What are those runners going to run? They're going to run a course. They're going to stay a course. I, I think, I, you know, when you go to a r race, too, they, they always announce the course. And you never pay attention because you're never going to win. You're always going to just follow the guy ahead of you. And I went to a race once, and they're doing their, you know, they're going on and on. And we actually laughed about it. Why do they tell us where we're going? We're just going to follow the guy that's in, in front. And so we get out there, and I'm running with a buddy, and he's doing like a 13K, and I'm going to do a 5-mile or a 5K. And we get out to the 5K turnaround or five, whatever it was. And they say, okay, if you're doing a short race, turn around. And I look at my buddy, and I go, you know, nobody's past us coming back, which if somebody was ahead of me, they would. So I make the turn, and I'm leading this race. And I'm thinking, I really wish I would have paid attention to them when they told me the course, because I didn't know where to go. And it's not a well-marked course. And the whole way back, I was thinking, wow. And I actually, had to, I actually won the race. It was crazy. But, and I, 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 at one point, I, had, I was hyperventilating. I, had to, I turned around to see where the guy behind me was, and he was far enough back that I could stop and slow down and catch my breath. But you got to pay attention to what the course is, because if I hadn't taken the, if, if I had shortcutted the course, they wouldn't have let me be the winner. You have to follow your course. I wouldn't have, I didn't get a crown, I got a, a medallion. But I, you wouldn't have gotten out. Like Paul says, it's a corruptible. Because mine looks to be gold, but it's, it's fake. <laughs> Just so you know. <laughs> it might be chocolate inside, actually. But it's interesting that Paul, he talks about running and getting that crown. And he talks about finishing his course and getting that crown of righteousness. Paul finished the course set out for him by the Lord Jesus Christ, and it was a tough course. Look over at, uh, turn back to 2 Timothy 4, and look at what he says when he started this. 2 Timothy 4, 
and verse 16. At, at my first answer, no man stood with me, but all men forsook me, forsook me. I pray, God, that it might not be laid to their charge. Notwithstanding, the Lord stood with me and strengthened me, that by me the preaching might be fully known, and that all the Gentiles might hear, and I was delivered out of the mouth of the lion. You know, I was in a, for a different study. I was I was looking at some of the stuff with Paul, and he says here that nobody stood with him at the first. And you can go and see when he went back to Jerusalem, Barnabas actually had to introduce him because they wanted nothing to do with him because of his thing. Notwithstanding the Lord, um, or verse sixteen, at my first answer, no men stood with me, but all men forsook me. But look at verse seventeen. Notwithstanding the Lord stood with me strengthened with me he was delivered out of the lion's den everyone at the beginning was trying to devour him trying to destroy him some probably with good cause but he would have been a very fearful in some circles people would have been very afraid with him with of him with good cause um, and only the Lord was with him but the, you see, the Lord wasn't just with him the Lord strengthened him the Lord will prepare you for the ta task at hand God doesn't say, okay, go out, do this, live your life, be, your, be an ambassador for me, and then not provide you with a way to do it. Wherever that happens to be, and, and let's, let's, let's admit, it's a little different than to do it in America than it is to do it in some of these countries where they're getting uh, persecuted. You know, it's a lot different to stand up for the defense of the, and right now it doesn't seem to be really government persecution, but this ISIS thing, it's a little different to stand up stand up for the defense of the gospel when the, first, the last three guys that did it got publicly beheaded so their whole family could see it. But God will prepare you. God will strengthen you. God says, here's the plan and here's what you need to do it. We are specifically now, he says, we're to be mature and we're to be zealous of good works. God's given us the Holy Spirit and he's got, given us his word. And that's what we need to accomplish his purpose. He will comfort us through his word. He wants us to have the mind of Christ. He wants us to be prepared to rule and reign with him in heavenly places. But he just hasn't said that's what you need to do. He's given us the Holy Spirit and the word of God to accomplish that in us. God will strengthen us. God did not commit the gospel to Paul and then abandon him. He didn't commit it to Paul and tell him, good luck hope this works out for you. There's some people in Jerusalem don't like you very much. You might be careful going down there. He committed the gospel to Paul, and then he strengthened Paul. And this is an inner strength. The physical strength, I, don't, I have no doubt. I, I, my, as I read through, I don't know that Paul looked like a very physically strong person, other than the fact that he survived everything, so there's some physical constitution there, but I don't think he was much to look at. But this strength, is this inner strength, this ability and, and it was something that he continually worked at, apparently, and rely, had to rely on God for, because he's, he, he sends in one of his letters, hey, pray that I'll be bold. Um, it was rough for Paul. I mean, sometimes I think maybe we think, well, Paul was God's guy, and, and it was all peaches and cream for Paul. It was tough. Paul, so I, I, I do, not everybody agrees with this, but I do believe that, that Paul, on a human level, on a fleshly level, he suffered some self-doubt from sometimes, and some... Some some issues of um, yeah self self doubt or you know like he said pray for me that I'll continue to be bold but then he gets to Timothy and says I I did it I finished my course and and then at the same time he he just a few verses later he says you know it was God that strengthened me when nobody was with me when I was all alone God strengthened me God stood with Paul I love that he says notwithstanding the Lord stood with me. Think about that. Out on a street corner, whatever he was doing, there's, there's little Timothy, and Paul's holding his hand, and he looks over, and there's God standing, and God's holding Paul's hand. That's not literally what happened. That's an example. But he said, I, loved, I just love that, that, vis, that visual of God standing with Paul, not leaving him, strengthening him, 
God stood with Paul and strengthened him so that by Paul the dispensation of grace would be fully known that all Gentiles would hear. Look at verse the second half of verse 17. By me the preaching might be fully known and that all the Gentiles might hear. Can I tell you, God's plan worked. The gospel of grace, the preaching of Jesus Christ according to the revelation of mystery, the preaching of the cross, it is fully known today. All the Gentiles have heard through the written word of God, completed by the writings of the Apostle Paul and preserved by God for all time. And all those things are important. It is the written word of God through which everybody today has heard the gospel. It might be spoken to them, but it originates with the word. There's no new revelation there. It is, it is the dispensation of grace through which the word of God is completed and we can understand the whole thing. And it is also God that has preserved it. And that's no, that's no small thing that the word of God has been preserved. You can go in every language, most languages, everybody can, in the world can go to the library, their library, and grab the word of God, the authentic, reliable word of God, off their shelf and rely on it completely. I don't know what version it is in Spanish or Russian or Hebrew. I know in the English language it is, in fact, the King James Bible. And it is, can be relied on 100%. I told you, I, you know, one guy I heard teaching one day, he stood up with the NIV, I think, and he said, okay, the NIV is wrong here. Why would you continue to use that? If, I, if you ever hear me say that about the King James Bible, then it's time to... Either the Word of God is reliable or it is not. Now, if Paul doesn't go through the things Paul goes through, Paul doesn't need to write 13 letters, and we don't have the completed Word of God. Unfortunately for Paul, <laughs> Paul was part of God's master plan, and Paul had a rough life, but it allowed, the, it allowed Paul to finish his course. I expect that you have found, found, or will find at times, that you feel like nobody is standing with you. I mean, I think everybody's shared, been excited to tell somebody about the saving grace of Jesus Christ, or about your fellow Christian or fellow or at work or your fellow family member about right division, about dispensational Bible study, or somebody has questions, you say, hey, I got the answer. And they look at you like, you're nuts. What are you talking about? And it can be crushing. You ever had this one? You're in a cult. You write dividers, you're ultra dispensationalist, and that's a cult. John 3.16 is all that matters. And you know what? You can feel like you're very alone. You can feel like you've been forsaken. Um, you guys have heard the story I've told. I'm not going to go into detail again about I, I got one guy that stood up right in front of my kids, spit on my face, called me, you're delusional. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> can I tell you? I mean, I, I think we've all been there. I mean, it's not unique to me. That can be a little intimidating. But you know, God stands with you at that moment. The Word of God says, when you, like Paul, feel like you're the only one standing for the truth, you have the Lord standing with you. You have the Lord strengthening with you. Satan's greatest attacks are on the preaching of the cross, are on Paul's ministry. Don't give up hope. God is on your side. God is standing with you. He's strengthening you. We think we need to be the strong ones. We don't need to be the strong ones. God will do that. God promises to stand with us. He promises to be the strong one. We need to study and be prepared. God will, be stand, will stand with us. God will strengthen us. You notice, too, that Paul talks about, when I alluded to this a little bit ago, that in Timothy here, the crown is an incorruptible crown. Crown uh, Second uh, Timothy 8, 4, verse 8. Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day, and not to me only, but unto all them also that love his appearing. Here he talks about the crown of righteousness. It's in Corinthians he talks about it's an uncorruptible crown. He continued that faith. He didn't take another course. When, it, when he was feeling forsaken, and he, when he was feeling weak, he could have taken another course. He even says at one point, why don't I just preach circumcision? Then, then, there, then the offense of the cross, wouldn't, there wouldn't 
it not be any more offense of the cross? There was a way out for Paul. Now, like he's like we read in Corinthians, I mean, woe unto him. But he didn't take the easy way. He took the hard way. And he got that uncorruptible, incorruptible crown of righteousness. Because another course wouldn't have been, a wrong course really wouldn't have been another course. It just would have been a wrong course. It would have taken him, the course he was on kept him in the will of God. Another course would have taken him out of the will of God. You know, it's a big conversation today. I really want to know what God's will for my life is today. I'm looking to, not me, not me. I'm looking to change jobs. And I, I, I hope God will give me his will on what's the right thing to do. And a street sign flashed the name of the company. And it was that was my sign from God. I, I, you know, I need to work on patience so God has, and I'm reminded of that every time God has a slow driver pull out in front of me. You don't find the will of God, God's will for you today in the circumstances of life. It's right here. It's easy to find. And it matters. And it will keep you on course. Staying on course will keep you in the will of God. Let me put it that way. Staying true to the doctrine, Paul's doctrine, the faith of the dispensation of grace to Gentiles today, the revelation of Jesus, uh, preaching of Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery, will keep you on course and will keep you in the will of God. So that when life's decisions and circumstances do come along, you can say, I know what the right thing to do here is. I'm going to do this. Tomorrow in the same situation, I might do that. But today, the right course of action is this. You keep the faith. You follow the sound words by relying on the strength of God. When you feel like you're alone, it's God that will comfort you. It is God that will strengthen you so that you will keep the faith. We talk a lot about this book. The Word of God will work effectually in those of you that believe. You know, that's a good place to start believing. That God will strengthen you. That God will, does. I'm not going to say well. Let me say does. Stand with you. If you believe those two things, how much easier are some of the other things to believe? And I understand it's tough. There are times when we feel like we're alone, when, when life's kicking us and we're looking for a way out. And boy, just to take a moment, have a few verses that you know or have written down in your wallet or your purse or your workstation. When that's down, you can look and, go, and, and have, your, have your rescue verse, if I can put it that way. And just look at that one. And it, 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 may, it may not be the same. It won't be the same for everybody. Not necessarily a person's life first, but a verse that you can look at and go, okay, I'll get through it today because I know God's on my side. God's standing with me. God is strength. I, I feel terrible. I feel weak. But it's okay because I am weak. But in my weakness, Christ strengthens me perfect. When I am weak, then am I strong. God's grace is sufficient for me. That's what we talk about when we're talking about keeping the faith. When we talk about keeping the course, finishing the course. Not getting blown with every wind of doctrine, no matter how gentle that breeze is, as you said the other day. S staying the course, understanding what the will of God is. Turn back over to Romans 1. Um, Romans 1, verse 5. But boy, what, a, what an important lesson for everybody to understand that God promises to stand with you, is standing with you. God promises to strengthen you. We don't forget, Paul is our example. Paul is that pattern. And uh, we can learn a lot. I, I think it's very important, too, sometimes to, to study the life of Paul. And remember that Paul was a man. And had the same struggles and same. I, I, I'm, I'm convinced. There were days Paul got up and said, I don't want to. I don't want to. I can just see him making his tent, knowing he's got to go to the synagogue tonight or go somewhere tonight, just thinking, I'm going to go get the, you know what, beat out of me, either physically or mentally. And I, I, I'm not up to it. And just sitting there, making his tent, 
singing his songs that he did. Reminding himself that he, that God is standing with him and that it is God that strengthened him. And then when it was time to do it, going and doing it. And then at the end, probably going, wow, okay, I'm so glad I did it. <laughs> Romans 1 verse 5. By whom we have received, Jesus Christ, by whom we have received grace and apostleship for obedience to the faith among all nations for his name, among whom ye, are ye also the called of Jesus Christ. We're going to turn to the end of Romans in just a moment. Paul says that his apostleship is to bring all nations to obedience to the faith. Now, when you read this, this, this is a verse that really should scream out at you that something has changed. And the word in there, the phrase that should let you know something's changed, because don't forget where we are, right? We're at the very beginning of Romans. Everything up to this point has been about Israel. For obedience to the faith among all nations. That should make a guy jump back and say, whoa, where did that come from? There's nothing about the nations obeying. God gave the nations up. He's been dealing with Israel. Israel needs to be faithful, but they're not to be reckoned among the nations. So something has, something has certainly changed here if now the nations are supposed to be faithful. You know, the nations were, and, and this might be kind of hard for people to get uh, people's head around. The nations were really never told to obey. They were told to bless Israel to receive a blessing. You know, I, I think I've said this before. If a nation in time past instituted a national nor, no pork rule, but still would not bless Israel, they would not receive blessing. In theory, and that's what the, a nation could, as, at a national level, a nation could do the law and not be in the will of God. If they were not blessing Israel, um, because I, and I think when you, when you find examples of the Gentile nations that do go, you, you don't ever hear about them, very rarely do you hear about them changing and becoming a copy of Israel. They just come and say, yeah, you are God's nation. Your God is the great God. Your God does do wonderful and marvelous things. Can I get some of that? But they, so for, for the Bible to come along, the word of God to come along, God to come along and say, okay, now you nations, you need to be obedient is one of those things, okay, I, well, let me read more because something's changed here. And, and it has because we are, the nations, as we find out in Romans, we are not to be obedient to the law. We're obedient to be, to be obedient to the faith. The things that Paul writes are the commandments of God. Look over at, um, we'll jump down to Romans one eleven. He says, For I long to see you, that I may impart unto you some spiritual gift, to the end ye may be established. So whatever's going on in this faith thing, we know it's going to establish the nations and, and us. Look at the end of Romans, Romans 16, 25. And look at the similarities between the beginning and the end of the, this book. Romans 16, verse 25. Now to him that is of power to establish you according to my gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery which kept secret since the world began but now is made manifest and by the scriptures of the prophets according to the commandment of, of the everlasting God look at this made known to all nations for the obedience of faith. Now the word the is not in there but you see the same thing. Now Paul's apostleship was to bring obedience to the faith. He starts Romans. He's, he says, uh, what I'm going to tell you is going to establish you in the faith. He gets to the end of the book of Romans. He says, okay, now that you've been established, you also can be stabilized. And here's how you do it. According to Paul's, there's three ways there. There's three things here in this passage. It can be kind of a little bit hard to discern. The first way that you're established is through Paul's gospel. Dispensation of grace to Gentiles today and the preaching of Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery. Now, those, uh, those are oftentimes said to be the same thing. The, we'll look at this. Paul 
preached Jesus Christ's death, burial, and resurrection according to the scriptures. Okay, that was a prophesied event. But Paul, Paul preached it, and he preached it for salvation. The difference is the revelation of the mystery. What, what else happened at the cross? We were now saved through the fall of Israel, not through Israel. We're now members of the body of Christ with a heavenly hope. We're not members of the little flock with an earthly hope. The third thing there, and we'll look at this in years when we get there in our study of Romans, is the scripture of the prophets. The scripture of the prophets here, that's not the Old Testament. It's the scriptures that the prophet in the individual church was keeping Paul's writing so that the person in the local church could go if they... because. In the local assembly, there, were, uh, there, was in the, there was the office of the prophet. And the prophet was not giving a prophecy. The prophet was taking Paul's letters and saying, yep, this one's scripture. Nope, this one's not scripture. This one is scripture. And you know that because we know, at least in Corinthians, he wrote three Corinthians. Okay, and there's another one too, the, uh, the letter to Laodicea. And there was a prophet who would serve, okay, yes, this was. And then that prophet would make copies so that the local assembly would have that. But they also kept the scriptures. So in your local assembly, you would go down and you would look, read the If you didn't have a copy of yourself at home, you would go down to the local assembly and you would read it. And that's the scripture of the prophets. We don't get, and you know it has to be because we don't get stabilized by the Old Testament. Now, we'll get more in depth in that at that time. But what I want you to see here is Paul's course was for the, his apostleship was for the obedience of the faith, to the faith of the nations and it was to establish them. You come to the end of the Romans and he says, okay, my writings, my gospel, the preaching of Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery, it will also stabilize you. It will provide you comfort. It will let you understand that God stands with you. It will let you understand that God strengthens you. And it is made known to all nations. Why? For the obedience of faith. Again, that nations is plural. Something has changed. Paul's course is different. Paul and Peter were not on the same course. They both preached Jesus Christ. Peter preached at Jesus Christ according to prophecy. Paul preached Jesus Christ according to it's a different course. It's the same man. It's the same God and Savior. But it's different. Um, we're, we're way out of time, aren't we? Oh, good news. Good news for me. <laughs> what Paul preaches is designed to establish you and to stabilize you. It's amazing that Romans starts and ends with that same goal. So in time past, the, at, the, at the time Paul was writing, there were, there were two courses. There were kind of two faiths, if I can put it that way, going on at the same time. There was, what the little, there was the little flock, the prophecy program, and the mystery program. That's not happening today. Today there is one faith. A Jew that believes in Jesus Christ as their Savior today goes into the body of Christ. The, the, um, the Gentile that, how do, I, how do I put this? The Gentile that believes he needs, the, he believe, for salvation believes he needs to send money to the nation of Israel in the Middle East today is going to hell. He's not getting saved today. That program doesn't exist anymore. Blessing Israel, while I am pro-Israel, and I be, not for religious reasons, but because it's an outpost of democracy in the Middle East, we don't get blessed because we bless Israel direct from God. There may, I mean, you know, and that's just be honest with you. Politically, that's a lot of the reason why America does support Israel is because a lot of people believe that we're getting blessed for that. But anyhow, that's neither here nor there. Today, there's one faith, and Paul talks about it. Um, I think we will end there because the next thing I want to get into is, is, in fact, I'll give you a little tease. Look over at Galatians 1.23. And you guys can think about this for a week. It says, 
but you can read on, on your own time for get the context but it says but they had heard only that he which persecuted us in times past now preached the faith which once he destroyed well if there's one faith and it's new with Paul how can he preach what he once destroyed that doesn't make any sense if there's one faith and it started with Paul how could he have once destroyed it if in time past so we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna look at that and um, I'll let you guys you can because I'm sure you'll spend a lot of time on it over the next week you, you can guys can test, uh, think about that maybe I'll ask you guys what you think on it because I, I that one I spent some time on that trying to figure out what in the world could that be and we'll look in it and it's it's again it's one of those great things that wow that's a question let me look into that and then you get to end up two hours later and you've had this great Bible study and it's just go wow that was pretty cool so um, we'll obviously be another week talking about the faith but understand that today there is one faith it is the body of work of Paul's it's the preaching of Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery it's Paul's gospel and it is where we come to find and come to understand and come to learn that God stands with us and God strengthens us. And, you know, it's easy to remember that when times are good and you don't need God's strength. If I can say that we always need God's strength. But boy, if it just be a little easier to remember that when you're feeling weak, you know. And uh, maybe just saying that will remind us that, hey, next time we're feeling weak, you know. Bible tells me I just need to rely on God that whatever this issue is it is bigger than me but it's not bigger than God and let I'll be weak and I'll let God be strong here and we'll see how that works out dear Heavenly Father we thank you that we can freely come and study your word and worship you in our country today Lord don't suffer the persecution that is happening in some parts of the world we thank you that you did send your son, the one Lord, the Lord Jesus Christ, in whom we find our redemption through his, his finished work of the cross, Lord, and that not only is our redemption and our salvation found in Christ, but all of our blessings, all of our spiritual blessings that are in heavenly places are in him as well, Lord. And I thank you that you do stand with us and that you are our strength. And my prayer would be, Lord, that we would rely on that and that would become of just such great importance in our lives today that we remember it is not our strength, Lord. Our strength will fail us. Your strength is greater than anything, Lord. And if we will rely on you, we will get through it. We thank you for that and we praise you for that, Lord, in your name.